Chapter 13. Ricardo's Theory of Rent. Conclusion. Section 1. Ricardo's assumption of the non-existence of landed property. Transition to new land is contingent on its situation and fertility. Back to Ricardo, Chapter 2, on rent. He begins by presenting the colonial theory, already known from Smith, and here it is sufficient to state briefly the logical sequence of ideas. Quote, On the first settling of a country, in which there is an abundance of rich and fertile land, a very small proportion of which is required to be cultivated for the support of the actual population, or indeed can be cultivated with the capital which the population can command, there will be no rent, for no one would pay for the use of land when there was an abundant quantity not yet appropriated, and therefore, because not appropriated, which Ricardo entirely forgets later on, at the disposal of whosoever might choose to cultivate it. Here, the assumption, therefore, is no landed property. Although this description of the process is approximately correct for the settlings of modern peoples, it is firstly inapplicable to developed capitalist production, and secondly equally false if put forward as the historical course of events in the old Europe. On the common principles of supply and demand, no rent could be paid for such land, for the reason stated why nothing is given for the use of air and water, or for any other of the gifts of nature which exist in boundless quantity. No charge is made for the use of these natural aids, because they are inexhaustible and at every man's disposal. If all land had the same properties, if it were unlimited in quantity, and uniform in quality, no charge could be made for its use, because it could not be converted into private property at all. Unless, where it possessed peculiar advantages of situation, and, he should add, were at the disposal of a proprietor, it is only then, because land is not unlimited in quantity and uniform in quality, and because in the progress of population, land of an inferior quality or less advantageously situated is called into cultivation, that rent is ever paid for the use of it. When in the progress of society, land of the second degree of fertility is taken into cultivation, rent immediately commences on that of the first quality, and the amount of that rent will depend on the difference in the quality of these two portions of land. We should examine this point more closely. The logical sequence is this. If rich and fertile land exists in elemental abundance, in practically unlimited quantity compared to the actual population and capital, and Ricardo assumes this on the first settling of a country, Smith's colonial theory, and if, furthermore, an abundant quantity of this land is not yet appropriated, and therefore, because it is not yet appropriated, is at the disposal of whosoever might choose to cultivate it, in this case, naturally, nothing is paid for the use of land. There is no rent. If land were available in unlimited quantity, not only relatively to capital and population, but if it were in fact an unlimited element, unlimited like air and water, then indeed its appropriation by one person could not exclude its appropriation by another. No private, also no public or state property, in land could exist. In this case, if all land is of the same quality, no rent could be paid for it at all. At most, rent would be paid to the possessor of land which, quote, possessed peculiar advantages of situation, end quote. Thus, under the circumstances assumed by Ricardo, namely that land is not appropriated, and uncultivated land is therefore at the disposal of whosoever might choose to cultivate it, if rent is paid, then this is only possible because land is not unlimited in quantity and uniform in quality. In other words, because different types of land exist, and land of the same type is limited. We say that on Ricardo's assumption, only a differential rent can be paid. But instead of confining it to this, he jumps at once to the conclusion that quite apart from his assumption of the non-existence of landed property, absolute rent is never paid for the use of land, only differential rent. The whole point, therefore, is if land confronts capital in elemental abundance, then capital operates in agriculture in the same way as in every other branch of industry. There is then no landed property, no rent. At most, where one piece of land is more fertile than another, there can be excess profits as an industry. In this case, these will consolidate themselves as differential rent because of their natural basis in the different degrees of fertility of the soil, 
If, on the other hand, land is firstly limited and secondly appropriated and capital finds landed property as a precondition, and this is the case where capitalist production develops, where capital does not find this precondition as it does in the old Europe, it creates it itself, as in the United States, thus land is from the outset not an elementary field of action for capital. Hence there is absolute rent, in addition to differential rent. But in this case, also the transitions from one type of land to another, be it ascending 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, or descending 4 to 1, work out differently than they did under Ricardo's assumption. For the employment of capital meets with the resistance of landed property both in category 1 and number 2, 3, and 4, and similarly in the reverse process when the transition is from 4 to 3, etc. In the descending transition, it is not sufficient for the price of number four to rise high enough to enable the capital to be employed in number three with an average profit. The price must rise to such an extent that rent can be paid on number three. If the transition is made from one to two, etc., then it is self-evident that the price which paid a rent for number one must not only pay this rent for number two, but a differential rent besides. By postulating the non-existence of landed property, Ricardo has not, of course, eliminated the law that arises with the existence and from the existence of landed property. Having just shown how on his assumption a differential rent can come into being, Ricardo continues, quote, When land of the third quality is taken into cultivation, rent immediately commences on the second, and it is regulated, as before, by the difference in their productive powers. At the same time, the rent of the first quality will rise, for that must always be above the rent of the second, by the difference between the produce which they yield with a given quantity of capital and labor. With every step in the progress of population, which shall oblige a country to have recourse to land of a worse country, to enable it to raise its supply of food, rent on all the more fertile land will rise. This is all right. Ricardo now passes on to an example, but quite apart from other points to be noted later, this example presupposes the descending line. This, however, is mere presupposition. In order to smuggle it in, he talks about, quote, the first settling of a country in which there is an abundance of rich and fertile land not yet appropriated, end quote. But the case would be the same if relatively to the colonists there was an abundance of poor and sterile land not yet appropriated. The non-payment of rents does not depend on the richness or fertility of the land, but on the fact that it is unlimited, unappropriated, and of uniform quality, whatever might be that quality as regards the degree of its fertility. Hence, Ricardo himself goes on to formulate his assumption thus. If all land had the same properties, if it were unlimited in quantity and uniform in quality, no charge could be made for its use. He does not say, and cannot say, if it were rich and fertile, because this condition would have absolutely nothing to do with the law. If, instead of being rich and fertile, the land were poor and sterile, then each colonist would have to cultivate a greater portion of the whole land, and thus, even where the land is unappropriated, they would, with the growth of population, more rapidly approach the point where the practical abundance of land, its actual unlimitedness in proportion to population and capital, would cease to exist. It is of course quite certain that the colonists will not pick out the least fertile land, but will choose the most fertile, i.e. the land that will produce most, with the means of cultivation at their disposal. But this is not the sole limiting factor in their choice. The first deciding factor for them is the situation, the situation near the sea, large rivers, etc. The land in West America, etc., may be as fertile as any, but the settlers of course establish themselves in New England, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Virginia, etc., in short, on the east coast of the Atlantic. If they selected the most fertile land, then they only selected the most fertile land in this region. This did not prevent them from cultivating more fertile land in the west. At a later stage, as soon as the growth of population, formation of capital, development of means of communication, building of towns, made the more fertile land in this more distant region accessible to them. They do not look for the most fertile region, but for the most favorably situated region, and within this, of course, given equal conditions so far as the situation is concerned, they look for the most fertile land. But this certainly does not prove that they progress from the more fertile region to the less fertile region, only that within the same region, provided the situation is the same, the more fertile land is naturally cultivated before the unfertile. Ricardo, however, having rightly amended abundance of rich and fertile land to read land of the, quote, same properties, unlimited in quantity, uniform in quality, end quote, 
comes to his example, and from there jumps back into the first false assumption. The most fertile and most favorably situated land will be first cultivated. He senses the weakness and spuriousness in this, and therefore adds the new condition to the most fertile land, quote, and the most favorably situated, end quote, which was missing at the outset. The most fertile land within the most favorable situation is how it should obviously read, and surely this absurdity cannot be carried so far as to say that the region of the country that happens to be the most favorably situated for the newcomers, since it enables them to keep in contact with the mother country and the old folks at home in the outside world, is the most fertile region in the whole of the land, which the colonists have not yet explored and are as yet unable to explore. The assumption of the descending line, the transition from the more fertile to the less fertile region, is thus surreptitiously brought in. All that can be said is this. In the region that is first cultivated, because it is the most favorably situated, no rent is paid until, within this region, there is a transition from the more fertile to the less fertile land. Now, if, however, there is a transition to a second, more fertile region than the first, then according to the assumption, this is worse situated. Hence, it is possible that the greater fertility of the soil is more than counterbalanced by the greater disadvantage of the situation, and in this case, the land of region number one will continue to pay rent. But the situation is a circumstance which changes historically, according to the economic development, and must continually improve with the installation of means of communication, the building of towns, etc., and the growth of the population. Hence, it is clear that by and by, the product produced in region number two will be brought onto the market at a price which will lower the rent in region number one again for the same product, and that in time, it will emerge as the more fertile soil in the measure in which the disadvantage of situation disappears. It is therefore clear that where Ricardo himself states the condition for the formation of differential rent correctly and in general form, quote, all land had the same properties, unlimited in quantity, uniform in quality, end quote, the circumstance of the transition from the more fertile to less fertile land is not included. That this transition is also historically incorrect for the settlements in the United States, which, in common with Adam Smith, he has in mind. Therefore, Carey's objections, which were justified on this point, that Ricardo himself reverses the problem again by his addendum on situation, the most fertile and most favorably situated land will be first cultivated, that Ricardo proves his arbitrary presupposition by an example in which that which is to be proved is postulated, namely the transition from the best to increasingly worse land, that finally, already with an eye to the explanation of the tendency of the general rate of profit to fall, he presupposes this because he could not otherwise account for differential rent, although the latter in no way depends on whether there is a transition from 1 to 2 to 3 and 4, or from 4 to 3 to 2 and 1. Section 2. The Ricardian Assertion that Rent Cannot Possibly Influence the Price of Corn. Absolute Rent Causes the Price of Agricultural Products to Rise. In the example, three sorts of land are postulated, numbers 1, 2, and 3, which, with an equal capital investment, yield a net produce of 100, 90, and 80 quarters of corn. Number 1 is the first to be cultivated, quote, in a new country where there is an abundance of fertile land compared with the population, and where therefore it is only necessary to cultivate number one, end quote. In this case, the whole net produce belongs to the cultivator, and will be the profits of the stock which he advances. That this net produce is immediately regarded as profit of stock, although no capitalist production has been postulated in this case, we are not speaking of plantations, is also unsatisfactory here but it may be that the colonist coming from the old country looks at it in this way himself. If the population grows only to such an extent that number two has to be cultivated, then number one bears a rent of ten quarters. It is of course assumed here that number two and number three are unappropriated, and that their quantity has remained practically unlimited in proportion to population and capital, otherwise there could be a different turn to events. Under this assumption, therefore, number one will bear a rent of ten quarters. Quote, For either, there must be two rates of profit on agricultural capital, or ten quarters, or the value of ten quarters, must be withdrawn from the produce of number one for some other purpose. Whether the proprietor of the land, or any other person, cultivated number one, these ten quarters would equally constitute rent, for the cultivator of number two would get the same result with his capital, whether he cultivated number one, paying ten quarters for rent, or continued to cultivate number two, paying no rent, 
In fact, there would be two rates of profit in agricultural capital. That is, number one supplied an excess profit of ten quarters, which, in this case, can consolidate itself as rent. But two pages later, Ricardo himself says that not only two, but many very different rates of profit on capital of the same description within the same sphere of production, hence also on agricultural capital, are not only possible, but inevitable. Quote, the most fertile and most favorably situated land will be first cultivated, and the exchangeable value of its produce will be adjusted in the same manner as the exchangeable value of all other commodities, by the total quantity of labor necessary in various forms, from first to last, to produce it and bring it to market. When land of an inferior quality is taken into cultivation, the exchangeable value of raw produce will rise because more labor is required to produce it. The exchangeable value of all commodities, whether they be manufactured or the produce of the mines or the produce of the land, is always regulated not by the less quantity of labor that will suffice for their production under circumstances highly favorable and exclusively enjoyed by those who have peculiar facilities of production, but by the greater quantity of labor necessarily bestowed on their production by those who have no such facilities, by those who continue to produce them under the most unfavorable circumstances meaning, by the most unfavorable circumstances, the most unfavorable under which the quantity of produce required renders it necessary to carry on the production. Thus, in each particular industry, there are not only two, but many rates of profit, that is to say, deviations from the general rate of profit. At this point, it is not necessary to go into the further details of the example, which is concerned with the effect of employing different amounts of capital on the same land. Only these two propositions to be noted. Number one, rent is always the difference between the produce obtained by the employment of two equal quantities of capital and labor. In other words, there is only differential rent, according to the assumption that there is no landed property. For number two, there cannot be two rates of profit. It is true that on the best land, the same produce would still be obtained with the same labor as before but its value would be enhanced in consequence of the diminished returns obtained by those who employed fresh labor and stock on the less fertile land. Notwithstanding, then, that the advantages of fertile over inferior lands are in no case lost, but only transferred from the cultivator or consumer to the landlord, yet, since more labor is required on the inferior lands, and since it is from such land only that we are enabled to furnish ourselves with the additional supply of raw produce, the comparative value of that produce will continue permanently above its former level, and make it exchange for more hats, cloth, shoes, etc., in the production of which no such additional quantity of labor is required. The reason, then, why raw produce rises in comparative value is because more labor is employed in the production of the last portion obtained, and not because a rent is paid to the landlord. The value of corn is regulated by the quantity of labor bestowed on its production on that quality of land, or with that portion of capital, which pays no rent. Corn is not high because a rent is paid, but a rent is paid because corn is high, and it has been justly observed that no reduction would take place in the price of corn, although landlords should forego the whole of their rent. Such a measure would only enable some farmers to live like gentlemen, but would not diminish the quantity of labor necessary to raise raw produce on the least productive land in cultivation. My earlier explanations render it unnecessary to expand here on the erroneousness of the proposition that the value of the corn is regulated by the quantity of labor bestowed on its production on that quality of land which pays no rent. I have shown that whether the last type of rent pays rent or pays no rent, whether it pays the whole of the absolute rent, only a part of it, or it pays beside the absolute rent a differential rent, if the line is ascending, partly depends on the direction of the line, whether it is ascending or descending, and at all events, it depends on the relative composition of agricultural capital as compared with the composition of non-agricultural capital. And if, as a result of the difference in this composition, absolute rent is presupposed, the above cases depend on the state of the market. But the Ricardian case in particular can only occur under two circumstances, although even then, firmage can be paid, though no rent. Either when landed property does not exist, in law or in fact, or when the best land provides an additional supply which can only find its place within the market if there is a fall in the market value. But there is more besides which is wrong or one-sided in the above passage. The comparative value which here means nothing but market value, of raw produce can rise for reasons other than the above. Firstly, if up to now it was sold below its value, perhaps below its cost price, 
This is always the case in a certain state of society, where the production of raw produce is as yet largely directed to the subsistence of the cultivator. Also in the Middle Ages, when the product of the town secured a monopoly price. Secondly, it can also happen that the raw produce, in contrast to the other commodities which are sold at their cost price, is not yet sold at its value. Finally, it is correct to say that it makes no difference to the price of corn if the landlord foregoes the differential rent and the farmer pockets it. But this does not apply to absolute rent. It is wrong to say here that landed property does not enhance the price of the raw produce. On the contrary, the price goes up because the intervention of landed property causes the raw produce to be sold at its value which exceeds its cost price. Supposing, as above, that the average non-agricultural capital consists of 80 constant and 20 variable, and the surplus value is 50%, then the rate of profit is 10%, and the value of the produce is 110. The agricultural capital, on the other hand, consists of 60 constant and 40 variable. The value of the produce is 120. The raw produce is sold at this value. If landed property did not exist legally or in practice because of the relative abundance of land as in the colonies, then it would be sold at 115. For the total profit of the first and the second capital, i.e. on the 200, equals 30. Hence, average profit equals 15. The non-agricultural produce would be sold at 115 instead of 110 the agricultural produce at 115 instead of 120. The relative value of the agricultural produce compared with the non-agricultural produce would thus fall by 1 12th. The average profit for both capitals, or the total capital, agricultural as well as industrial, would however rise by 50% from 10 to 15. Of his own conception of rent, Ricardo says, quote, I always consider it as the result of a partial monopoly, never really regulating price that is, never acting as a monopoly, hence also never the result of monopoly. For him, the only result of monopoly could be that the rent is pocketed by the owner of the better types of land rather than by the farmer. But rather, as the effect of it, if all rent were relinquished by landlords, I am of opinion that the commodities produced on the land would be no cheaper, because there is always a portion of the same commodities produced on land for which no rent is or can be paid, as the surplus produce is only sufficient to pay the profits of stock. Here, surplus produce is equal to the excess over the product absorbed by the wages. Assuming that certain land never pays rent, Ricardo's assertion is only correct if this land, or rather its product, regulates the market value. If, on the other hand, its product pays no rent because the market value is regulated by the more fertile land, then this fact proves nothing. It would indeed benefit the farmers if the differential rent were relinquished by the landlords. The relinquishment of absolute rent, on the other hand, would reduce the price of agricultural products and increase that of industrial products to the extent that the average profit grew by this process. The rise of rent is always the effect of the increasing wealth of the country and of the difficulty of providing food for its augmented population. The latter is wrong. Wealth increases most rapidly in those countries where the disposable land is most fertile, where importation is least restricted, and where, through agricultural improvements, productions can be multiplied without any increase in the proportional quantity of labor, and where consequently the progress of rent is slow. The absolute amount of rent can also grow when the rate of rent remains the same, and only the capital invested in agriculture is growing with the growth of population. It can grow when no rent is paid on number one, and only a part of the absolute rent on number two, but the differential rent has risen considerably as a result of their relative fertility, etc. Section 3. Smith's and Ricardo's Conception of the Natural Price of the Agricultural Product Quote, If the high price of corn were the effect, and not the cause, of rent, Price would be proportionally influenced as rents were high or low, and rent would be a component part of price. But that corn which is produced by the greatest quantity of labor is the regulator of the price of corn, and rent does not and cannot enter in the least degree as a component part of its price. Raw material enters into the composition of most commodities, but the value of that raw material, as well as corn, is regulated by the productiveness of the portion of capital last employed on the land and paying no rent and therefore rent is not a component part of the price of commodities. There is much confusion here, resulting from the jumbling up of natural price and value. 
Ricardo has adopted this confusion from Smith. In the case of the latter, it is relatively correct, because, and insofar as, Smith departs from his own correct explanation of value. Neither rent, nor profit, nor wages form a component part of the value of a commodity. On the contrary, the value of a commodity being given, the different parts into which that value may be divided belong either to the category of accumulated labor, that is constant capital, or wages, or profit, or rent. On the other hand, when referring to the natural price or cost price, Smith can speak of its component parts as given preconditions. But by confusing natural price with value, he carries this over to the value of the commodity. Apart from the fact that the raw material and machinery, in short the constant capital, enter into production with a fixed price, which to the capitalist in each particular sphere of production appears as determined from outside, there are two things the capitalist must do when calculating the price of his commodity. He has to add the price of the wages, and this also appears to him as given, within certain limits. The natural price of the commodity is not the market price, but the average market price over a long period, or the central point towards which the market price gravitates. In this context, therefore, the price of wages is on the whole determined by the value of labor power. But the rate of profit, the natural rate of profit, is determined by the value of the aggregate of commodities created by the aggregate of capitals employed in non-agricultural industry. For it is the excess of this value over the value of the constant capital plus the value of wages. The total surplus value which the capital creates forms the absolute amount of profit. The ratio of this absolute amount to the whole capital advanced determines the general rate of profit. Thus, this general rate of profit, too, appears not only to the individual capitalist, but to the capital in each particular sphere of production to be determined externally. The capitalist must add the general profit, say of 10%, to the price of the raw material, etc., contained in the product, and the natural price of wages, as it must appear to him by way of addition of component parts or by composition, to form the natural price of a given commodity. Whether the natural price is paid, or more or less, depends on the level of the market price prevailing at the time. Only wages and profit enter into cost price as distinguished from value. Rent enters only insofar as it is already contained in the price of the expended raw material, machinery, etc. That is, it does not enter as rent for the capitalist, to whom, in any case, the price of raw produce and machinery, in short, of the constant capital, appears as a predetermined total. Rent does not enter into cost price as a component part. If, in special circumstances, the agricultural product is sold at its cost price, then no rent exists. Economically, landed property does not then exist for capital. That is, when the product of the type of land that sells at the cost price regulates the market value of the product of its sphere. Or, absolute rent exists. In this case, the agricultural product is sold above its cost price. It is sold at its value which is above its cost price. Rent, however, enters into the market value of the product, or rather, forms a part of the market value. But to the farmer, rent appears as predetermined, in the same way as profit does to the industrialist. It is determined by the excess of the value of the agricultural product over its cost price. The farmer, however, calculates just like the capitalist. First, the outlay, secondly, wages, thirdly, the average profit, finally, the rent, which likewise appears to him as fixed. This is, for him, the natural price of wheat, for instance. Whether he obtains it depends in turn on the prevailing state of the market. If the distinction between cost price and value is properly maintained, then rent can never enter into cost price as a constituent part, and one can talk of constituent parts only in relation to the cost price, as distinguished from the value of the commodity. Like excess profit, Differential rent never enters into cost price because it is nothing but the excess of the market cost price over the individual cost price, or the excess of market value over individual value. Accordingly, Ricardo is in substance right when in opposition to Adam Smith, he declares that rent never enters into cost price. But again he is wrong in that he proves this not by differentiating between cost price and value, but by identifying the two, as Adam Smith did, for neither rent nor profit nor wages form constituent parts of value, although value is dissolvable into wages, profits, and rent, and furthermore, the three parts are of equal importance if all three exist. Ricardo reasons thus, 
Rent forms no constituent part of the natural price of agricultural produce because the price of the product of the worst land, which is equal to the cost price of this product and to the value of this product, determines the market value of agricultural produce. Thus, rent forms no constituent part of the value because it forms no constituent part of the natural price, and this latter is equal to value. This, however, is wrong. The price of the product grown on the worst land equals its cost price, either because this product is sold below its value, therefore not, as Ricardo says, because it is sold at its value, or because the agricultural product belongs to that type, to that class of commodities in which, by way of exception, value and cost price are identical. This is the case when the surplus value, which is made in a particular sphere of production on a given capital, say of 100 pounds, happens to coincide with the surplus value which on the average falls to the same relative portion of the total capital, say 100 pounds. This then is Ricardo's confusion. As to Adam Smith, insofar as he identifies cost price with value, he is justified, on the basis of this false assumption, in saying that rent, as well as profit and wages, form constituent parts of the natural price. On the contrary, it is rather inconsistent that later, in his further exposition, he asserts that rent does not enter into the natural price in the same way as wages and profits. He commits this inconsistency because observation and correct analysis compel him nevertheless to recognize that there is a difference in the determination of the natural price of the non-agricultural produce and the market value of agricultural produce. But more about this when discussing Smith's theory of rent. Section 4. Ricardo's Views on Improvements in Agriculture His Failure to Understand the Economic Consequences of Changes in the Organic Composition of Agricultural Capital Quote, We have seen that with every portion of additional capital which it becomes necessary to employ on the land with a less productive return, rent would rise. But not every portion of additional capital yields a less productive return. It follows from the same principles that any circumstances in the society which should make it unnecessary to employ the same amount of capital on the land, and which should therefore make the portion last employed more productive, would lower rent. That is, lower absolute rent, not necessarily differential rent. Such circumstances might be the reduction in the capital of a country followed by a reduction in the population, but also a higher development of the productive powers of agricultural labor. The same effects may, however, be produced when the wealth and population of a country are increased, if that increase is accompanied by such marked improvements in agriculture as shall have the same effect of diminishing the necessity of cultivating the poorer lands, or of expending the same amount of capital on the cultivation of the more fertile portions. Oddly enough, Ricardo forgets here improvements as will have the effect of improving the quality of poorer lands, and converting these into richer ones, an aspect stressed by Anderson. The following proposition of Ricardo's is entirely wrong. With the same population, and no more, there can be no demand for any additional quantity of corn. Quite apart from the fact that with a fall in the price of corn, an additional demand for other raw produce, green vegetables, meat, etc., will spring up, and that schnapps, etc., can be made from corn, Ricardo assumes here that the entire population consumes as much corn as it likes. This is wrong. Quote from F. W. Newman, Lectures on Political Economy, Our enormous increase of consumption in 1848, 49, and 50 shows that we were previously underfed and that prices were forced up by the deficiency of supply. The same Newman says, The Ricardo argument, that rent cannot enhance price, turns on the assumption that the power of demanding rent can in no case of real life diminish supply. But why not? there were very considerable tracts which would immediately have been cultivated if no rent could have been demanded for them, but which were artificially kept vacant, either because landlords could let them advantageously as a shooting ground or prefer the romantic wilderness to the petty and nominal rent which alone they could get by allowing them to be cultivated. Indeed, it is in any case wrong to say that if he withdraws the land from the production of corn, he may not get a rent by converting it into pasture or building grounds, or as in some counties in the highlands of Scotland, into artificial woods for hunting purposes. Ricardo distinguishes two kinds of improvements in agriculture. The one type, those which increase the productive powers of the land, are such as the more skillful rotation of crops or the better choice of manure. These improvements absolutely enable us to obtain the same produce from a smaller quantity of land. 
In this case, according to Ricardo, rent must fall. If, for example, the successive portions of capital yielded 100, 90, 80, and 70, whilst I employed these four portions, my rent would be 60, or the difference between 70 and 100 at 30, 70 and 90 at 20, or 70 and 80 at 10. And while I employed these portions, the rent would never remain the same, although the produce of each should have an equal augmentation. If it had an unequal augmentation, it would be possible for the rent to rise despite the increased fertility. If, instead of 100, 90, 80, and 70, the produce should be increased to 125, 115, 105, and 95, the rent would still be 60, or the difference between 95 and 125 at 30, 95 and 115 at 20, 95 and 105 at 10. But with such an increase of produce, without an increase of demand, there could be no motive for employing so much capital in the land. One portion would be withdrawn, and consequently the last portion of capital would yield 105 instead of 95, and rent would fall to 30, or the difference between 105 and 125 at 20, and 105 and 115 at 10, whilst the produce would still be adequate to the wants of the population. Apart from demand being able to rise without a growth in population when the price falls, Ricardo himself assumes that it has risen by five quarters, there is a constant going over to soils of decreasing fertility because the population grows every year, i.e. the part of the population that consumes corn eats bread, and this part grows more rapidly than the population as a whole because bread is the chief means of subsistence of the majority. It is thus not necessary to assume that the demand does not grow with the productivity of capital, and that consequently the rent falls. And the rent can rise if the difference in the degree of fertility has been unevenly affected by the improvement. Otherwise, it is certain that the increase in fertility, while demand remains constant, can not only throw the worst land out of the market, but can even force a part of the capital on better land to withdraw from the production of corn. In this case, the corn rent falls if the augmentation of the produce is equal on the different types of land. Now Ricardo passes on to the second aspect of agricultural improvements. But there are improvements which may lower the relative value of produce without lowering the corn rent, though they will lower the money rent of land. Such improvements do not increase the productive powers of the land, but they enable us to obtain its produce with less labor. They are rather directed to the formation of capital applied to the land than to the cultivation of the land itself. Improvements in agricultural implements, such as the plow and the thrashing machine, economy and the use of horses employed in husbandry, and a better knowledge of the veterinary art, are of this nature. Less capital, which is the same thing as less labor, will be employed on the land. But to obtain the same produce, less land cannot be cultivated. Whether improvements of this kind, however, affect corn rent, must depend on the question whether the difference between the produce obtained by the employment of different portions of capital be increased stationary, or diminished. Ricardo should also have adhered to this when dealing with the natural fertility of the soils. Whether the transition to these reduces the differential rent, leaves it stationary, or increases it, depends on whether the difference in the produce of the capital employed on these different, more fertile soils be increased, stationary, or diminished. If four portions of capital, 50, 60, 70, and 80, be employed on the land, giving each the same results, and any improvement in the formation of such capital should enable me to withdraw five from each so that they should be 45, 55, 65, and 75, no alteration would take place in the corn rent. But if the improvements were such as to enable me to make the whole saving on that portion of capital which is least productively employed, corn rent would immediately fall, because the difference between the capital most productive and the capital least productive would be diminished, and it is this difference which constitutes rent. This is correct for differential rent, which alone exists for Ricardo. On the other hand, Ricardo does not touch upon the real question at all. For the solution of this question, it does not matter whether the value of the individual quarter falls or whether the same quantity of land, the same types of land as previously, needs to be cultivated, but whether as a result of the reduction in the price of constant capital, which, according to the assumption, costs less labor, the quantity of immediate labor employed in agriculture is reduced, increased, or unaltered. In short, whether or not the capital undergoes an organic change. Let us take our example from Table A, and let us substitute quarters of corn for tons. It is assumed here that the composition of the non-agricultural capital is 80C and 20V, 
that of the agricultural capital, 60C and 40V, the rate of surplus value in both cases being 50%. Hence, the rent on the agricultural capital, or the excess of its value over its cost price, is £10. Thus, we have the following table. The aforementioned graphic will not be read aloud for the recording. Please consult Section 4 of Chapter 13 of a physical or digital copy of the book for visual reference. In order to examine the problem in its pure form, one must assume that the magnitude of the capital employed in 1, 2, and 3 is in all three classes affected equally by the reduction in the price of constant capital. For the uneven effect only concerns differential rent and has nothing to do with the matter in hand. Supposing, therefore, that as a result of improvements, the same amount of capital, which previously cost £100, now only costs 90 it would thus be reduced by one-tenth, or 10%. The question is then how the improvements affect the composition of agricultural capital. If the proportion of variable capital to constant capital remains the same, then if 100 pounds consists of 60 constant and 40 variable, 90 consists of 54 constant and 36 variable, and in this case, the value of the 60 quarters on land 1 is 108 pounds. But if the reduction in price were such that the same constant capital which previously cost 60 now only cost 54, but that the variable capital, or that laid out in wages, now only cost 32 and two-fifths pounds instead of 36, i.e. it had also fallen by one-tenth, then 86 and two-fifths pounds would be laid out instead of 100. The composition of this capital would be 54 constant and 32 and two-fifths variable, and reckoned on 100 pounds, the composition would be 62 and a half constant and 37 and a half variable. Under these circumstances, the value of the 60 quarters on number 1 would be equal to 102 and three-fifths pounds. Finally, let us assume that although the value of the constant capital decreases, the capital laid out in wages remains the same absolutely. It therefore grows in proportion to the constant capital, so that the capital of 90 pounds which has been laid out consists of 50 constant and 40 variable. The composition of a capital of 100 would be 55 and 5 ninths constant and 44 and 4 ninths variable. Now let us see what happens to corn and money rent in these three cases. In case B, the proportion of constant to variable remains the same, although the value of both decreases. In case C, the value of the constant capital decreases, but proportionately, that of the variable capital decreases even more. In case D, only the value of the constant capital decreases, not that of the variable. First, let us reproduce the original table contained on the previous page, and then let us compare it with the new tables B, C, and D representing the cases just described, illustrating the changes in value of the organic component parts of the agricultural capital. From the accompanying table, the following is evident. Originally, in A, the ratio is 60C to 40V. The capital invested in each class is 100. The rent in money amounts to 70 pounds, in corn to 35 quarters. In B, the constant capital becomes cheaper, so that only 90 pounds are invested in each class. The variable capital, however, becomes cheaper in the same proportion, so that the ratio remains the same. Here, the money rent falls. The corn rent remains the same. The absolute rent is also the same. Money rent decreases because the capital invested decreases. Corn rent remains the same because less money produces relatively more corn, the ratio remaining the same. In C, cheaper constant capital, but the value of the variable capital decreases even more, so that the constant capital becomes relatively dearer. Absolute rent falls. Corn rent falls and money rent falls. Money rent, because capital in general has decreased significantly, and corn rent, because absolute rent has fallen, while the differences between the various categories have remained the same, therefore all of them fall equally. In D, however, the case is completely the reverse. Only the constant capital falls. The variable capital remains the same. This was Ricardo's assumption. In this case, because of the fall in capital, the money rent falls, though the fall is quite insignificant. In absolute figures, it is only one-third of a pound, but in proportion to the capital laid out, it rises considerably. The corn rent, on the other hand, grows absolutely. Why? Because the absolute rent has risen from 10 to 12 and 2 ninths percent, because the variable capital has grown in proportion to the constant capital. Hence, the following table. 
Ricardo continues, Whatever diminishes the inequality in the produce obtained from successive portions of capital employed on the same or on new land tends to lower rent, and whatever increases that inequality necessarily produces an opposite effect and tends to raise it. The inequality can be increased while capital is withdrawn and while fertility increases, or even while less fertile land is thrown out of the market. In an editorial of the 15th of July, 1862, the Morning Star examines whose duty it is, voluntarily or compulsorily, to support the distressed workmen in the cotton manufacture districts of Lancashire, etc. It says, quote, These people have a legal right to maintenance out of the property they have mostly created by their industry. It is said that the men who have made fortunes by the cotton industry are those upon whom it is especially incumbent to come forward with a generous relief. No doubt it is so. The mercantile and manufacturing sections have done so. But is this the only class which has made money by the cotton manufacture? Assuredly not. The landed proprietors of Lancashire and North Cheshire have enormously participated in the wealth thus produced, and it is the peculiar advantage of these proprietors to have participated in the wealth without lending a hand or a thought to the industry that created it. The mill owner has given his capital, his skill, and his unwinking vigilance to the creation of this great industry, now staggering under so heavy a blow. The mill hand has given his skill, his time, and his bodily labor. But what have the landed proprietors of Lancashire given? Nothing at all, literally nothing. And yet they have made from it more substantial gains than either of the other classes. It is certain that the increase of the yearly income of these great landlords, attributable to this single cause, is something enormous, probably not less than threefold. The capitalist is the direct exploiter of the workers, not only the direct appropriator, but the direct creator of surplus labor. But since, for the industrial capitalist, this can only take place through and in the process of production, he is himself a functionary of this production, its director. The landlord, on the other hand, has a claim through landed property to absolute rent and because of the physical differences of the various types of land to differential rent, which enables him to pocket a part of this surplus labor or surplus value to whose direction and creation he contributes nothing. Where there is a conflict, therefore, the capitalist regards him as a mere superfetation, a sybarite excrescence, a parasite on capitalist production, the louse that sits upon him. On Chapter 3, On the Rent of Mines The rent of mines, as well as the rent of land, is the effect and never the cause of high value of their produce. So far as absolute rent is concerned, it is neither effect nor cause of the high value, but the effect of the excess of value over cost price. That this excess is paid for the produce of the mine or the land, and thus absolute rent is formed, is the effect not of that excess, because it exists for a whole class of trades, where it does not enter into the price of the produce of those particular branches of production, but is the effect of landed property. In regard to differential rent, it may be said that it is the effect of high value, so far as by high value is understood the excess of the market value of the produce over its real or individual value for the relatively more fertile classes of land or mind. That Ricardo understands by the exchangeable value, regulating the produce of the poorest land or mind, nothing but cost price, by cost price nothing but the advances plus the ordinary profit, and that he falsely identifies this cost price with real value, will also be seen from the following passage. The metal produced from the poorest mine that has worked must at least have an exchangeable value not only sufficient to procure all the clothes, food, and other necessaries consumed by those employed in working it and bringing the produce to market, but also to afford the common and ordinary profits to him who advances the stock necessary to carry on the undertaking. The return for capital from the poorest mine paying no rent would regulate the rent of all the other more productive mines. This mine is supposed to yield the usual profits of stock. All that the other mines produce more than this will necessarily be paid to the owners for rent. Here, therefore, he says in plain language, rent equals excess of the price of the agricultural produce over its cost price, that is, over the value of the capital advanced plus the usual or average profits of stock. Hence, if the value of the agricultural produce is higher than its cost price, it can pay rent quite irrespectively of differences in land. The poorest land and the poorest mine can pay the same absolute rent as the richest, 
If its value were no higher than its cost price, rent could only arise from the excess of the market value over the real value of the produce derived from relatively more fertile soils, etc. If equal quantities of labor with equal quantities of fixed capital could at all times obtain, from that mine which paid no rent, equal quantities of gold, the quantity of gold indeed would enlarge with the demand, but its value would be invariable. What applies to gold and mines applies to corn and land. Hence, if the same types of land continued to be exploited and continued to yield the same product for the same outlay in labor, then the value of the pound of gold or the quarter of wheat would remain the same, although its quantity would increase with the demand. Thus, its rent, the amount, not the rate of rent, would also grow without any change in the price of the produce. More capital would be employed, although productivity would remain constant. This is one of the major causes of the rise in the absolute amount of rent, quite apart from any rise in the price of produce, and therefore without any proportional change in the rents paid by produce of different soils and mines. Section 5. Ricardo's Criticism of Adam Smith's and Malthus's Views on Rent On Chapter 24, Doctrine of Adam Smith Concerning the Rent of Land This chapter is of great importance for the difference between Ricardo and Adam Smith. We shall postpone a fuller discussion of this, insofar as it affects Adam Smith, to when we consider ex professo Adam Smith's doctrine after that of Ricardo. Ricardo begins by quoting a passage from Adam Smith, showing that he correctly determined when the price of the agricultural produce yields a rent and when it does not. But on the other hand, Smith thought that some parts of the produce of land, such as food, must always yield a rent. In this context, Ricardo says the following, which is significant for him. I believe that as yet in every country, from the rudest to the most refined, there is land of such quality that it cannot yield a produce more than sufficiently valuable to replace the stock employed upon it, together with the profits ordinary and usual in that country. In America, we all know that is the case, and yet no one maintains that the principles which regulate rent are different in that country and in Europe. Indeed, these principles are substantially different. Where no landed property exists, actual or legal, no absolute rent can exist. It is absolute rent, not differential rent, which is the adequate expression of landed property. To say that the same principles regulate rent, where landed property exists and where it does not exist, means that the economic form of landed property is independent of whether landed property exists or not. Besides, what is the meaning of there is land of such a quality that it cannot yield a produce more than sufficiently valuable to replace the stock with the ordinary profits? If the same quantity of labor produces four quarters, the product is no more valuable than if it produces two, although the value of the individual quarter is in one case twice as great as in the other. Whether or not it yields a rent is therefore in no way independent of the magnitude of this value of the produce as such. It can only yield a rent if its value is higher than its cost price, which depends on the cost price of all other products, or, in other words, on the quota of unpaid labor, which is on an average appropriated by a capital of £100 in each sphere of production. But whether its value is higher than its cost price is in no way dependent on its absolute size, but on the composition of the capital employed on it, compared with the average composition of the capital employed in non-agricultural industry. But if it were true that England had so far advanced in cultivation that at this time there were no lands remaining which did not afford a rent, it would be equally true that there formerly must have been such lands, and that whether there be or not is of no importance to this question. For it is the same thing if there be any capital employed in Great Britain on land which yields only the return of stock with its ordinary profits, whether it be employed on old or on new land. If a farmer agrees on land for a lease of seven or fourteen years, he may propose to employ on it a capital of ten thousand pounds. Knowing that at the existing price of grain and raw produce, he can replace that part of his stock which he is obliged to expend, pay his rent, and obtain the general rate of profit. He will not employ 11,000 unless the last thousand can be employed so productively as to afford him the usual profits of stock. In his calculation, whether he shall employ it or not, he considers only whether the price of the raw produce is sufficient to replace his expenses and profits, for he knows that he shall have no additional rent to pay. Even at the expiration of his lease, his rent will not be raised, for if his landlord should require rent, because this additional £1,000 was employed, he would withdraw it, since by employing it, he gets by the supposition only the ordinary and usual profits which he may obtain by any other employment of stock, 
and therefore he cannot afford to pay a rent for it, unless the price of raw produce should further rise, or, which is the same thing, unless the usual and general rate of profits should fall. Ricardo admits here that also the worst land can bear a rent. How does he explain this? To provide the additional supply which has become necessary in consequence of an additional demand, a second amount of capital is employed on the worst land. This will only yield the cost price if the price of grain is rising. Hence, the first amount would now yield a surplus, that is, rent, over and above this cost price. In fact, therefore, before the second amount is invested, the first amount of capital yields a rent on the worst land, because the market value is above the cost price. Thus, the only question is whether, for this to happen, the market value has to be above the value of the worst product, or whether, on the contrary, its value is above its cost price, and the rise in price merely enables it to be sold at its value. Furthermore, why must the price be so high that it equals the cost price, i.e. the capital advanced plus average profit? Because of the competition of capitals in the different branches of production, and the transfer of capital from one branch to another. That is, as a result of the action of capital upon capital. But by what action could capital compel landed property to allow the value of the product to fall to the cost price? Withdrawal of capital from agriculture cannot have this effect, unless it is accompanied by a fall of the demand for agricultural produce. It would achieve the reverse, and cause the market price of agricultural produce to rise above its value. Transfer of new capital to land cannot have this effect either, for it is precisely the competition of capitals amongst themselves which enables the landlord to demand from the individual capitalist that he should be satisfied with an average profit, and pay over to him the surplus of the value over the price affording this profit. But it may be asked, if landed property gives the power to sell the product above its cost price, at its value, why does it not equally well give the power to sell the product above its value, at an arbitrary monopoly price? On a small island, where there is no foreign trade in corn, the corn, food like any other product, could unquestionably be sold at a monopoly price, that is, at a price only limited by the state of demand, i.e. of demand backed by ability to pay. And according to the price level of the product supplied, the magnitude and extent of this effective demand can vary greatly. Leaving out of account exceptions of this kind, which cannot occur in European countries, even in England a large part of the fertile land is artificially withdrawn from agriculture and from the market in general in order to raise the value for the other part, landed property can only affect and paralyze the action of capitals, their competition, insofar as the competition of capitals modifies the determination of the values of the commodities. The conversion of values into cost prices is only the consequence and result of the development of capitalist production. Originally, commodities are on the average sold at their values. Deviation from this is, in agriculture, prevented by landed property. Ricardo says that when a farmer takes land on a lease of 7 or 14 years, he calculates that with a capital investment of, say, £10,000, the value of the corn, that is, average market value, permits him to replace his outlay plus average profit, plus the contracted rent. Insofar as he takes a lease of a piece of land, therefore, his first consideration is the average market value, which is equivalent to the value of the product. Profit and rent are only parts into which this value is resolved, but they do not constitute it. The existing market price is, for the capitalist, what the presupposed value of the product is for the theory and the inner relationships of production. Now to the conclusion which Ricardo draws from this. If the farmer adds another thousand pounds, he only considers whether with the given market price it yields him the usual profit. Ricardo, therefore, seems to think that the cost price is the determining factor, and that profit enters into this cost price as a regulating element, but rent does not. Firstly, profit too does not enter into it as a constituent element, for according to the assumption, the farmer takes the market price as his starting point, and weighs up whether at this given market price the £1,000 will yield him the usual profit. This profit is therefore not the cause, but the effect of that price. But, Ricardo continues his train of thought, the investment of the thousand pounds itself is determined by the calculation of whether or not the price yields the profit. Thus the profit is the decisive factor for the investment of the thousand pounds, and for the price of production. Furthermore, if the capitalist found that the thousand pounds did not yield the usual profit, he would not invest it. The production of the additional food would not take place. If it were necessary for the additional demand, then the demand would have to raise the price, i.e. the market price, until it yielded the profit. 
Thus profit, in contradistinction to rent, enters as a constituent element not because it creates the value of the product, but because the product itself would not be created if its price did not rise high enough to pay the usual rate of profit as well as the capital expended. In this case, however, it is not necessary for it to rise so high as to pay rent. Hence, there exists an essential difference between rent and profit, and in a certain sense, it can be said that profit is a constituent element of price, whereas rent is not. This thought is evidently also at the back of Adam Smith's mind. In this case, it is correct. But why? Because in this case, landed property cannot confront capital as landed property. Thus, the very combination of circumstances under which rent, absolute rent, is formed is not present, according to the assumption. The additional corn produced with the second investment of the 1,000 pounds, provided the market value remains the same, in other words, when an additional demand arises only on the assumption that the price remains the same, must be sold below its value at the cost price. This additional produce of the 1,000 pounds thus occurs under the same circumstances as when new, worse land is cultivated, which does not determine the market value, but can provide the additional supply only on the condition that it supplies it at the previously existing market value, i.e. at a price determined independently of this new production. Under these circumstances, it depends entirely on the relative fertility of the additional soil whether it yields a rent, precisely because it does not determine the market value. It is just the same with the additional thousand pounds on the old land, and for this very reason, Ricardo concludes conversely that the additional land, or the additional amount of capital, determines the market value, because, with a given, quite independently determined market value, the price of its product yields not rent, but only profit, and only covers the cost price, but not the value of the product. This is a contradiction in terms. Nevertheless, the product is produced in this case, although it yields no rent. Certainly, landed property is an independent, opposing element does not exist for the farmer, i.e. the capitalist, during the period in which the lease in fact makes him the landowner of the land which he has rented. Capital moves unimpeded in this element, and capital is satisfied with the cost price of the product. Even when the lease expires, the farmer will naturally make the amount of rent dependent on how far capital investment in the land will supply a product which can be sold at its value, thus yielding a rent. Capital investment, which, with a given market value, yields no excess over the cost price, no more enters into the calculation than would the payment of rent, or contractual undertaking to pay rent, on land whose relative fertility is so low that the market price is merely equal to the cost price of its product. In practice, matters do not always work out in the Ricardian manner. If the farmer possesses some spare capital, or acquires some during the first years of a lease of 14 years, he does not demand the usual profit unless he has borrowed additional capital. For what is he to do with the spare capital? Conclude a new lease for the additional land? Agricultural production favors to a much higher degree more intensive capital investment, rather than a more extensive cultivation of land with a larger capital. Moreover, if no land could be leased in the immediate vicinity of the old land, two farms would split up the farmer's work of superintending them to a much greater extent than six factories would split up the work of one capitalist in manufacture. Or should he invest the money with the bank, for interest, in government bonds, railway shares, etc.? Then from the outset, he foregoes at least half or a third of the usual profit. Hence, if he can invest it as additional capital on the old farm, even below the average rate of profit, say a 10% if his profit was 12, then he will still be gaining 100% if the rate of interest is 5%. To invest the additional thousand pounds in the old farm is therefore still a profitable speculation for him. Hence, it is quite wrong for Ricardo to identify this investment of additional capital with the application of additional capital to new soils. In the first case, the product does not have to yield the usual profit, even in capitalist production, it must only yield as much above the usual rate of interest as will make worthwhile the trouble and risk of the farmer to prefer the industrial employment of a spare capital rather than its employment as money capital. But the following conclusion which Ricardo draws from this observation is, as has been shown, quite absurd. If the comprehensive mind of Adam Smith had been directed to this fact, he would not have maintained that rent forms one of the component parts of the price of raw produce, for prices everywhere regulated by the return obtained by this last portion of capital, for which no rent whatever is paid. His illustration proves just the reverse, that the application to land of this last portion of capital has been regulated by a market price which, independent of that application, existed before it took place, 
and therefore comprises no rent but only profit. That profit is the only regulator for capitalist production is quite true, and it is therefore true that no absolute rent would exist if production were regulated solely by capital. It arises precisely at the point where the conditions of production enable the landowner to set up barriers against the exclusive regulation of production by capital. Secondly, Ricardo reproaches Adam Smith for developing the correct principles of rent only with regard to coal mines. He even says, quote, The whole principle of rent is here admirably and perspicuously explained, but every word is as applicable to land as it is to mines. Yet he affirms that it is otherwise in estates above ground. Adam Smith senses that under certain circumstances, the landlord has the power to offer effective resistance to capital, to bring landed property into play, and thus to demand absolute rent, although under different circumstances, he does not possess this power. That in particular, however, the production of food establishes the law of rent, whereas in other applications of capital to land, the rent is determined by the agricultural rent. Adam Smith says, quote, the proportion, both of their produce and of their rent, is in proportion to their absolute and not to their relative fertility. In his reply, Ricardo comes closest to the real principle of rent. He says, quote, But suppose that there were no land which did not afford a rent. Then the amount of rent on the worst land would be in proportion to the excess of the value of the produce above the expenditure of capital and the ordinary profits of stock. The same principle would govern the rent of land of a somewhat better quality, or more favorably situated, and therefore the rent of this land would exceed the rent of that inferior to it, by the superior advantages which it possessed. The same might be said of that of the third quality, and so on to the very best. Is it not, then, as certain that it is the relative fertility of the land which determines the portion of the produce which shall be paid for the rent of land, as it is that the relative fertility of mines determines the portion of their produce which shall be paid for the rent of mines. Here, Ricardo formulates the correct principle of rent. If the worst land pays a rent, if therefore rent is paid independently of the different natural fertility of the land, i.e. absolute rent, then this rent must equal, quote, the excess of the value of the produce above the expenditure of capital and the ordinary profits of stock, end quote. That is to say, it must equal the excess of the value of the produce above its cost price. Ricardo presupposes that such an excess cannot exist, because in contradiction to his own principles, he wrongly accepts the Smithian doctrine that value equals cost price of the produce. As for the rest, he again falls into error. Differential rent would of course be determined by the relative fertility. Absolute rent would have nothing to do with natural fertility. Smith, however, would indeed be right when he asserts that the actual rent paid by the worst land may depend on the absolute fertility of the other soils and the relative fertility of the worst soil, or on the absolute fertility of the worst soil and the relative fertility of the others. For the actual amount of rent paid by the worst land depends not, as Ricardo thinks, on the excess value of its own produce over its cost price, but on the excess of the market value over its cost price. But these are very different things. If the market price were determined by the product of the worst land, then the market value would be equal to its real value. Hence, the excess of its market value over its cost price would be equal to the excess of its own individual value, its real value, over its cost price. But this is not the case if, quite irrespective of this product, the market price is determined by the other types of land. Ricardo assumes a descending line. He assumes that the worst land is cultivated last, and is only cultivated, in the case postulated, when the additional demand has necessitated an additional supply at the value of the produce derived from the worst and last cultivated soil. In this case, the value of the worst land regulates the market value. In the ascending line, even according to him, this will only occur when the additional supply of the better sorts of land only equals the additional demand at the old market value. If the additional supply is greater, Ricardo assumes that the old land must be thrown out of cultivation, but it only follows from this that it will yield a lower rent than before, or no rent at all. The same happens in the descending line. Whether and to what extent the worse land yields rent, if the additional supply can only be provided at the old market value, depends on how much this market value stands above the cost price of the product of the new, worse land. In both cases, its rent is determined by the absolute fertility, not the relative fertility. It depends on the absolute fertility of the new land how far the market value of the produce of better lands stands above its own real individual value, 
Adam Smith makes a correct distinction here between land and mines, because with the latter, he presupposes that there is never a transition to worse sorts, always to better ones, and that they always provide more than the necessary additional supply. The rent of the worst land is then dependent on its absolute fertility. After Adam Smith has declared that there are some mines which can only be worked by the owners, as they will afford only sufficient to defray the expense of working, together with the ordinary profits of the capital employed, we should expect that he would admit that it was these particular mines which regulated the price of the produce from all mines. If the old mines are insufficient to supply the quantity of coal required, the price of coal will rise, and will continue rising till the owner of a new and inferior mine finds that he can obtain the usual profits of stock by working his mine. It appears, then, that it is always the least fertile mine which regulates the price of coal. Adam Smith, however, is of a different opinion. He observes that the most fertile coal mine, too, regulates the price of coals at all the other mines in its neighborhood. Both the proprietor and the undertaker of the work find, the one that he can get a greater rent, the other that he can get a greater profit by somewhat underselling all their neighbors. Their neighbors are soon obliged to sell at the same price, though they cannot so well afford it, and though it always diminishes and sometimes takes away altogether both their rent and their profit. Some works are abandoned altogether, others can afford no rent, and can be wrought only by the proprietor. If the demand for coal should be diminished, or if by new processes the quantity should be increased, the price would fall, and some mines would be abandoned. But in every case, the price must be sufficient to pay the expenses and profit of that mine which is worked without being charged rent. It is therefore the least fertile mine which regulates price. Indeed, it is so stated in another place by Adam Smith himself, for he says, The lowest price at which coals can be sold for any considerable time is like that of all other commodities, the price which is barely sufficient to replace, together with its ordinary profits, the stock which must be employed in bringing them to market. At a coal mine for which the landlord can get no rent, but which he must either work himself or let it alone altogether, the price of coals must generally be nearly about this price. Adam Smith is mistaken when he declares the particular set of circumstances on the market, under which the most fertile mine or land dominates the market, to be the rule. But provided such a case is assumed, his reasoning is correct on the whole, and Ricardo is wrong. Adam Smith presupposes that as a result of the state of demand, and because of its relative superior fertility, the best mine can only force the whole of its product onto the market if it undersells its competitors, if its product is sold below the old market value. This causes the price to fall for the worst mines too. The market price falls. This, in any case, lowers the rent on worse mines, and can even make it disappear completely. For the rent is equal to the excess of market value over cost price of the produce, whether that market value be like the individual value of the produce of a certain class of land or mines or not. What Smith fails to notice is that the profit can only be diminished by this if it becomes necessary to withdraw capital and reduce the scale of production. If the market price, regulated as it is under the given circumstances by the produce of the best mines, falls so low as to afford no excess above the cost price for the product of the worst mine, then it can be worked only by its owner. At this market price, no capitalist will pay him a rent. His ownership of the land does not, in this case, give him power over capital. But as far as he is concerned, it annuls the resistance which other capitalists meet who wish to apply capital to land. Landed property does not exist for him because he himself is the landed proprietor. Hence, he can use his land as a mine, or in any other sphere of production, i.e. he can employ it if the market price, which he finds predetermined and does not determine himself, if this market price of the product yields him the average profit, that is, his cost price. And from this, Ricardo concludes that Smith contradicts himself, because the old market price determines how far new mines can be opened up by their owners, in other words, they can be worked in circumstances where landed property disappears, since at the old market price they yield their cultivators the cost price. He concludes that this cost price determines the market price. But again, he takes refuge in the descending line, and allows the less fertile mine to be cultivated only when the market price of the product rises above the value of the product of the better mines, whereas it is only necessary that it rises above the cost price, or even that it equals the cost price in the case of the worst mines exploited by the proprietors themselves. Incidentally, his assumption that if by new processes the quantity of coal should be increased, the price would fall and some mines would be abandoned, 
depends only on the degree of the fall in price and the state of demand. If, with this fall of prices, the market can absorb the whole product, then the bad mines will still yield a rent, provided the fall of market price still leaves an excess of market value over the cost price of the poorer mines, and the mines will be worked by their owners if the market value only covers, or is equal to, the cost price. In either case, however, it is absurd to say that the cost price of the worst mine regulates the market price. Although the cost price of the worst mine determines the relation of the price of its produce to the ruling market price, and therefore decides the question whether or not the mine can be worked. But the fact that a piece of land or a mine of a particular degree of fertility can be exploited at a given market price is obviously not related to or identical with the determination of the market price by the cost price of the produce of these mines. If an increased market value would make an additional supply necessary or possible, then the worst land would regulate the market value, but then it would also yield absolute rent. This is the exact opposite of the case assumed by Adam Smith. Thirdly, Ricardo reproaches Smith for believing that cheapness of raw produce, for instance substitution of potatoes for corn, which would lower the wage and diminish the cost of production, would cause a larger share, as well as a larger quantity, to fall to the landlord. Ricardo, on the other hand, maintains that, quote, no part of that additional proportion would go to rent, but the whole invariably to profits, while lands of the same quality were cultivated and there was no alteration in their relative fertility or advantages, rent would always bear the same proportion to the gross produce. This is positively wrong. The share of rent would fall, and therefore its quantity would decrease relatively. The introduction of potatoes as the principal means of subsistence would reduce the value of labor power, shorten the necessary labor time, increase the surplus labor time, and therefore the rate of surplus value. Hence, other circumstances remaining the same, the composition of the capital would be altered. The value of the variable part would diminish in comparison with that of the constant part, although the quantity of living labor employed remained the same. The rate of profit would therefore rise. In this case, there would be a fall in absolute rent, and proportionately in differential rent. This factor would affect equally agricultural and non-agricultural capital. The general rate of profit would rise, and the rent would consequently fall. On Chapter 28, on the Comparative Value of Gold, Corn, and Labor in Rich and Poor Countries. Quote, Dr. Smith's error throughout his whole work lies in supposing that the value of corn is constant, that though the value of all other things may, the value of corn never can be raised. Corn, according to him, is always of the same value because it will always feed the same number of people. In the same manner, it might be said that cloth is always of the same value because it will always make the same number of coats. What can value have to do with the power of feeding and clothing? Dr. Smith has so ably supported the doctrine of the natural price of commodities ultimately regulating their market price. Estimated in corn, gold may be of very different value in two countries. I have endeavored to show that it will be low in rich countries and high in poor countries. Adam Smith is of a different opinion. He thinks that the value of gold estimated in corn is highest in rich countries. On Chapter 32, Mr. Malthus's Opinions on Rent Quote, rent is a creation of value, but not a creation of wealth. In speaking of the high price of corn, Mr. Malthus evidently does not mean the price per quarter or per bushel, but rather the excess of price for which the whole produce will sell above the cost of its production, including always in the term cost of its production profits as well as wages. 150 quarters of corn at £3.10 shillings per quarter would yield a larger rent to the landlord than 100 quarters at £4 provided the cost of production were in both cases the same. Whatever the nature of the land may be, high rent must always depend on the high price of the produce, but given the high price, rent must be high in proportion to abundance and not to scarcity. As rent is the effect of the high price of corn, the loss of rent is the effect of a low price. Foreign corn never enters into competition with such home corn as affords a rent. The fall of price invariably affects the landlord till the whole of his rent is absorbed. If it falls still more, the price will not afford even the common profits of stock. Capital will then quit the land for some other employment, and the corn, which was before grown upon it, will then, and not until then, be imported. From the loss of rent, there will be a loss of value, of estimated money value, but there will be a gain of wealth, 
the amount of the raw produce and other productions together will be increased from the greater facility with which they are produced. They will, though augmented in quantity, be diminished in value. 